Uh, good evening and welcome everybody. Uh, this is the uh, second last uh, uh, episode of the History of Medicine webinar series hosted by RCSI Bahrain. My apologies for the lateness uh, of uh, this evening's start. We've had some technical difficulties, but we're ready to go, I think. And we welcome Professor John Flood, who's Professor and Head of the Department of Medicine here at RCSI Bahrain. He's going to talk to us tonight about what we can learn about disease in ancient time from paleopathology. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Professor Flood. Thank you. So uh, good evening after everyone. Uh, this is a continuation of um, the talk which I did about four or five weeks ago, uh, which um, it was in which I looked at paleopathology, in other words, diseases in ancient populations. Uh, this, the, the talk was, uh, of course, um, uh, uh, had about 120 slides, so it was too long for one hour. So rather than create a new topic, I decided uh, to continue uh, the talk from the last time. So it's three topics today, um, it basically about 12 minutes for each topic. The total time will be about 35 minutes, 40 minutes. So the first thing I want to talk about is, of course, radiocarbon dating, which I think is a, a basic background um, uh, to the idea of uh, of the well, basically background to the advances that have been made in, in paleoarchaeology and paleopathology in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and of course, it's the transfer of, um, of expertise from, from physics and chemistry. And that's where the advances have been made mostly in archaeology and in, uh, in the last, certainly in the last one or two decades. Uh, so we, in order to understand uh, the isotope, the use of isotopes in the analysis of diet in ancient populations, which is the second topic, we have to look at radiocarbon dating first. Uh, and uh, so that'll be five minutes to give you an idea of what isotopes are, uh, how radiocarbon dating is used, uh, what its limitations are, and then we'll move on to the analysis of diet in ancient populations. And then the last part of the talk will be on tuberculosis. I have lots more stuff on uh, worm infestations, um, uh, malaria, um, Chagas disease, all of these in ancient populations. So it's not just TB that's been identified, in large numbers of other diseases as well. But I think uh, for the sake of, um, of uh, simplicity, brevity, and uh, not giving you too much information, too much detail, so you, don't, so you don't go away confused and full of information that doesn't come together, I decided just to limit it to TB today. Okay, so um, uh, unfortunately, because the talk's a month old, or because the, the knowledge that I uh, put together is a month old, I'm going to have to refer to my, pap you know, my papers and my writings today more than I would normally. Uh, so I apologise if you see me spending my time looking down at um, at, uh, at uh, bits of paper, um, but I have to do it unfortunately because the stuff's a month old. So the first thing is uh, really what is radiocarbon dating? Well, uh, believe it or not, uh, we have a facility in Ireland. Before I tell you what it is, we have a facility in Ireland, but it's not actually in the Republic. It's up in Belfast and Queens. So we don't have a radiocarbon dating. Um, uh, mass spectrometry actually in the Republic of Ireland, which is a disgrace. We have to depend on Queens and Belfast. In England, uh, the main place for uh, radiocarbon dating is Oxford. So, um, so what is radiocarbon dating? Well, it's a technique that's used um, where we you use it to basically analyze. Uh, you can use any type of material. You can use wood. You can use charcoal. You can use, for example, cremated remains of humans. You can use bone, teeth. Um, you can use ceramics, for believe it or not, um, to try and analyze how old these uh, uh, specimens are of both humans and of artifacts or um, materials used by humans in past times. Now, um, uh, the um, as you know, uh, first thing you have to understand is what, what is an isotope. So we have um, an isotope basically is a va is it is, is a um, uh, there are various isotopes of carbon, for example, and of chemical compounds, and they all have different quantities of, of uh, neutrinos. For example, the classical one is carbon 12, 13, and 14. And they just have extra neut uh, neutrons in each one of them. So if you analyze the carbon quantity of carbon in the atmosphere and in, bio in biological specimens, in, biologi in, bio bio in, in, in just nature, if you analyze it, there the, the are three isotopes. There's carbon-12, there's 13 and 14. As you can see, it says that on the diagram. Now, uh, carbon-12 and 13, of course, make up the 99.9% of the total amount of, uh, of carbon uh, isotopes. And carbon-14, which is radioactive, 
it makes up a tiny quantity. I found a figure that one trillionth um, of the atoms in the atmosphere is carbon-14. Um, uh, so it is a very tiny amount um, in nature. Now, how is it created? Well, uh, the um, stratosphere is bombarded by cosmic rays every day, and these convert nitrogen-14 uh, into um, carbon-14 with a loss of a proton. That's how carbon-14 is made. And then that carbon-14 is recycled. It goes into the soil, it's, it goes into the grass, for example, it gets, it's used up in photosynthesis uh, in, by plants, and it gets into plants, and the plants then are eaten by animals, and then other animals eat those animals, and then we eat the animals that, for example, cattle, sheep, and so on, get in, and then therefore the carbon-14 gets into our systems. And the carbon-14 continues to uh, accumulate in our systems right through the active life of the plant or the organism. Uh, and eventually then basically uh, when the organism dies, then the carbon-14 begins to decay. Uh, and you can work out then uh, the decay by the half-life of the uh, carbon-14 in the specimen, whether it's a human body or whether it's actually uh, other artifacts found around tombs or just in nature. Uh, you can work out then uh, how old that specimen is by the loss of carbon-14, because once the organism dies, the carbon-14 then basically decays in according to its half-life. And the half-life um, of carbon-14 is about 5,700 years, um, plus or minus 40. And the reason the figure isn't accurate is because the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere varies with time. So how do we know it's actually reliable? Well, the uh, paleopathologists, what they've done is, and the archaeologists and chemists as well, and, and people in physics, is they have compared carbon-14 in specimens versus carbon-14 in, for example, wood. So we know with every year uh, trees accumulate a, um, a layer of growth uh, and say, say the plant, say the tree is 100 years old, they will have 100 rings uh, to uh, correspond to its age. And each one of those rings will have a carbon-14 fingerprint on it. And therefore, if it's are 100 rings, you can work out uh, how accurate that carbon-14 is done by, when you analyze it versus the age of the plant. And this is how, or the tree in this case, this is how the reliability is checked for carbon-14. And, um, and therefore, there is a graph which shows a linear relationship between carbon-14 uh, and one axis, and then uh, the date of the tree, for example, and the other axis. And the line is actually straight. It's a linear relationship. But actually, so carbon-14 does correlate very well uh, with um, tree ring analysis in uh, trees when you use them uh, to compare. There are problems still, though. It's not that it's the, the problems created are created by a number of things. For example, fossil fuels, which are because the half-life of uh, carbon-14 is 5,700 roughly, uh, and you can only use it to analyze material that's probably 14,000 years old. Anything older than that, its reliability uh, goes down. But of course, in fossil fuels, which are millions of years old, there's no carbon-14 because it is all decayed. Therefore, when uh, people who were in Victorian times, the 19th century during industrialization, were burning fossil fuels, and even now we burn fossil fuels, it produces um, carbon that basically gets into the atmosphere, but it's not carbon-14. Uh, but it dilutes the carbon in the atmosphere, which is carbon dioxide, and therefore the carbon-14 that's there already is diluted down, so it gives you a low figure. And the, the other time it's con contaminated, of course, is with nuclear explosions. So in the 1960s, when the British, Americans, Russians, and all these crazy countries were blowing up atomic bombs, they were actually producing uh, carbon-14 in the atmosphere, and that was giving excess carbon-14 that you would uh, not ex normally find uh, in relation to geological and biological time. So that's why when you, you see the expression of carbon-14 results for a particular specimen, it says 5,600 years plus or minus 14, plus or minus 50 years and so on. That's where the inaccuracy comes from. Now, that's the analysis, that's the background. That's all you really need to know um, uh, about carbon-14. So that will bring us on then to, um, which is the next topic I want to talk about. Uh, is diet. So just one other point I'd like to make is that um, is that the course the carbon-14 is not just in the atmosphere and in us. It's in so uh, it's in water, it's in deep oceans, it's in um, biological material like trees and soil and so on and so forth as is, as depicted on this picture. Um, and as, but of course the the carbon-14 in us is um, is in equilibrium with atmosphere. 
But carbon-14, for example, in marine specimens, they're different because, of course, the uh, marine specimens are, um, unless they're deep, deep sea water fish, are on the surface a couple of first couple of hundred meters. But of course, water, uh, the, the main carbon sink, the main sink for carbon in, 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 bio, in biological life is in deep water, deep oceans. And of course, the water in the deep ocean circulates surface oceans only every one, once, only every thousand years. So it's not this again introduces another element of inaccuracy because of um, uh, this very slow circulation of water from deep oceans to surface water and so on and so forth. So it's not absolutely perfect, but it is reasonably good and does, has made a huge impact uh, on dating uh, archaeological specimens. That's all we need to know now about carbon-14 while we move on. So, uh, so Neville, can we move on to the next slide, please? Uh, we have to move on a couple of slides. Uh, so just stop there. So the, as you can see, carbon-14, uh, so of course, it's, it's made from nitrogen uh, with uh, cosmic rays hitting nitrogen, makes carbon-14. Carbon-14 then gets into biological tissues um, and gets into um, nature and humans and animals and so on. And um, and then, uh, then uh, when it gets into tissues, or when it's in the atmosphere, it's of course in the form of carbon dioxide. When they actually analyze it with the mass spectrometer and they burn the specimen, uh, so the specimen, specimen of course, is destroyed. Um, and it previously they used to use the gamma counter because it makes it, it emits a weak beta rays. Beta, uh, it's a weak beta emitter. But now they use max, a mass spectrometer to do it, and it'll analyze the actual atoms. Problem is they have to burn the specimens. So the specimens are destroyed. That's the downside of carbon dating. Uh, but what they do is they burn it, and then they make carbon dioxide, and then they count uh, the uh, carbon-14 atoms in the gas. That's how it's actually analyzed with the mass spectrometer. And as I said, it's it's a daughter of nitrogen, and you can see the half life is five thousand seven hundred and thirty. There are older specimens. The other thing they use in more in geophysics, as you, if you go down, you can see potassium forty and argon. Potassium converts to argon, or there sorry, potassium is derived from argon, and you can see that is a much better um, uh, um, isotope to use for geophysics. And they can see because it goes back to billions of years, but it's not used very much in biological tissues for analysis. So we used to tend to use just carbon-14. So that's the background to carbon-14. There's much more to it, but that's basically the background. Now I'm going to move on, and this shows you um, the uh, this, this, this is the half-life. So as you can see, first half-life is 5,730. The next one is 11,000, 17, 22, and 28. But after the second half-life, it's really the accuracy drops off. So it's very good for roughly 10,000 years. Which is good enough for you know human specimens and um, uh, uh, and the stuff you would use in basic archaeology. Uh, right. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, I thought this would be a nice area, a nice section, or nice topic to bring in in relation to the famine. Um, and um, the so I'll we'll talk about the famine first, and then I'll talk about diet. So there's been a lot of work done uh, in the last ten years um, in relation to the famine. Um, and it's been an excellent book published by uh, Cork University Press on the Irish famine and also one on the 1916 rising. Absolutely superb text, about 50 pounds to buy and several hundred pages, very high quality material. And uh, a lot of the um, uh, data I have comes from uh, the one uh, published by Cork University Press. Now, the first slide shows um, uh, the state of Ireland as regards a uh, level of influence, level of, level of income, level of wealth, level of poverty, whatever you want to put in, and the literacy rates for the Irish around just around the time of the famine. And you can see, uh, for all, we start off at Gaul and Mayo, look at um, Mayo, 60% of the population, lower class housing, 13% uh, were educated in some way. Galway almost as bad, but Dublin, my, so my asset's not great, but Dublin looks like 54%. Uh, were literate and only 9% of the population uh, were in lower class housing. So in spite of all the, well, it's not a mythology, it's a fact, despite of all the the um, the uh, material published on the slums of Dublin and Belfast the same, um, the, the other parts of Ireland were much poorer. Uh, and uh, as you can see, when you compare Gaul and Mayo uh, to Dublin, so, uh, and there are not a lot of prices, um, given to how poor the country was outside Dublin. So a lot has been given to us to the slums of Dublin and Belfast and Glasgow and so on, the Gorbals. So this shows you um, the population fall in Ireland for the period of 1841 to 51. Um, and um, as you can see, uh, Roscommon, 
The dark area is over 30%. So it's common North Clare, North Mayo, Dreadful and Kerry and Cork as well. Uh, and not much uh, uh, and slightly better, if that's the way you'd, one would phrase it in, for example, uh, up towards Northern Ireland. And as you can see people moved into the big cities, into the workhouses, of course, uh, in the workhouses of Dublin, Kilkenny, Cork and so on. That's why they're gone green. Um, and of course, the areas with the highest population fall were the areas in which the famine had the greatest impact. And I have done locums in Roscommon uh, for Patrick Hugh many years ago, and um, the physiotherapy department there is in the old workhouse, um, which is around the St. Francis, around the corner from the main hospital. Some excellent condition. Uh, and uh, that, if you saw um, how they managed to cram thousands of people into a building of only four floors, it's actually quite amazing. Uh, but Roscommon took a big impact and there's a monument outside the workhouse or the St. Francis Hospital commemorating the great loss of population and deaths in Roscommon. Right, as you can as you can see, um, this again reflects the severity um, of um, uh, of the in, and the impact of the family. Again, the west of Ireland, the west part of Kerry, uh, but Belfast and um, Belfast and Dublin not as badly impacted. Next slide, please. OK, this is an interesting one. Uh, so as you can see, in 1740, the Irish population was uh, roughly 3 million and then it hits a peak around 1820, 1830, just before the famine of nearly 9 million. And then from uh, 1830 down to the early 19, early 1900, the population drops right back down to about 3, 4, maybe uh, 4 million. So the um, population drops from 9 to 4 million over that last 50 years, up to 1860, 1900. A lot of that was immigration, but a lot of it, of course, were, were uh, deaths. Uh, and then it's only now that's been recovering, as you can see, when you come up to the 1980s, of a population of over close to 5 million. As you can see, Europe has got a linear, uh, a linear uh, rise in population uh, without any blip on it, even though we'd expect a population change with the wars, the First and Second World War. So you can see that the Irish famine had a greater impact in Ireland that the two wars had in Europe, European population. You know, you think that the first, second world war, 30, 40 million people probably died with, between um, citizens and armies of Russia and different countries and Britain and so on. Yet it didn't have any in, impact at all on the population rise, but the Irish famine had a dramatic impact, much greater than either of the first, first and second world wars. I'll show you how, uh, great an impact to, uh, the famine had on Ireland. I put this one in, I don't want to, this is a talk all on its own. Uh, this is a very sad story of a population of Irish people uh, somewhere in County Mayo near, uh, near, um, near Westport, I think. Uh, and they got a um, uh, information that there would be food rations provided by the local uh, administrators of the workhouse in Castlebar and in Loch Ray. And they walked 13 miles through the countryside in the winter, about 60 or 70, maybe 100 people in 1845, 1845-46, uh, I think. And um, they went to this large country house where the, um, the where the uh, governors of the Loch Ray Love Workhouse and the Castle Bar Workhouse were actually convening to decide about how to distribute arms to the local people. The people stood outside and they were informed by this, the um, by the butler that the, um, con that the governors were having dinner and people were standing outside looking in the window, well, these very overweight, I presume, um, Anglo-Irish um, administrators sitting in there, stuffing their faces and everybody outside uh, looking in at them starving. And they were told they weren't going to get any vouchers and they walked back and at something like 40 people died uh, trek trekking through the Irish countryside, both there and back. And this is, um, uh, this Duloc tragedy is a commemoration of that, and that's how uh, dreadful and, and the Irish famine had had on um, on populations, you know, local populations. Next slide, Nevin. Okay, this is typical eviction. Um, what they did, the RIC, which were uh, Irishmen as well, in collaboration with the English aristocracy and the English establishment, would come in and um, basically. Uh, point their guns at the local Irish population while their houses have been destroyed for not paying their rent. So, uh, so um, what's the uh, relation between diet, isotopes and the Irish famine? 
Well, um, there's been uh, some uh, some studies done which I've given to Prof Corbley about um, analysis of uh, of uh, inmates of the Kilkenny uh, workhouse, and this work has been published by um, uh, the academics in Bradford. Bradford University has got a very good paleoarchaeology and uh, archaeology department, and they've been doing uh, some research on the bodies um, exhumed from the graveyard attached to Kilkenny workhouse. Um, showing um, isotope changes in the bodies of the children and the and the inmates, uh, and uh, the paper is really interesting. So, what does the paper tell us? Well, it shows, for example, uh, the transformation from uh, a diet for children onto a wheat diet, onto a maize diet. Of course, because uh, during one of the responses to the famine was an importation, importing was in, that uh, maize was imported from the United States. And distributed this form of arms, arms to the population, but of course the maize was absolutely appallingly difficult to boil or to cook, and uh, it made a gruel like porridge and so on, uh, and most people couldn't eat it. But it was a C4, what we call a carbon four type of food, as a contrast to carbon C3, which is um, which, which is a potato plant. So that brings us along to isotopes of and how you actually analyze diet in elderly population in ancient populations, and there are a number of ways of doing it. You can look, for example, at pots that have been left and analyze the food residues in the pots, like, for example, fat sticks to ceramics, and you can analyze on using max spectrometer the different types of fats, cooking fats. You can use poo, for example, there's a big study on at the moment in, in, in Herculaneum and Pompeii done by Wallace Hadrill in Cambridge, he's a professor of classics, and he's looking at the content, the, the seed content of poo in the latrines of Pompeii and Herculaneum to look at their diet. You can also look, for example, at teeth, teeth and bone and um, uh, and dental calculus. So cal dental calculus is a deposition of food particles in teeth which calcifies and it's um, got a micro environment of its own. It's very resistant to uh, breakdown after death. And um, so uh, dental calculi are used extensively to look at ancient diets and have a micro environment inside of uh, fossilized food contents. On the previous diet, so they are actually broken. Of course, you've got to use hydrochloric acid to break them down. Then they're analyzed using chemical methods. So that's one way uh, you can show uh, evidence of previous diet. Uh, ceramics is another. Of course, um, animal deposits local to the to, to the population area, for example, all from villages or even um, uh, animal uh, remains at um, grave sites will also tell you what people were eating, mollusks and so on. So the, the food contents. Locally, can also the food contents left in as um, as artifacts can also tell you what people were eating. The other thing you can use, of course, is to look at DNA, and uh, you can look at, for example, lactose intolerance. When people, humans were developed the ability to uh, to metabolize milk, and you can show then a transformation from uh, when people humans started to use milk and milk products as part of their diet. Now, uh, I don't want to go on too much about this the whole topic on its own, but I just want to give you uh, uh, some examples, uh, practical examples of how you can see the find evidence of diet uh, in different populations. And I have about six studies I'll, of which the Irish famine is one. So uh, just a brief uh, outline of teeth. So teeth are very resistant to uh, damage that's done after death. So for example, when humans die, the body gets dissolved, of course, it gets broken down, soft tissue gets broken down by bacteria, but the bone structures change as well. Uh, it's called diegesis in archaeological uh, circles. So it means that the, the collagen in it and the hydroxyapatite, the mineral part, uh, reforms itself. Uh, so the protein content is gradually leached away and collagen re re restructures itself, the amino acids are broken down and so on. But the hydroxyapatite bit, which all of you I'm sure are familiar with, um, which is the calcium phosphate deposition in the collagen, uh, changes as well, but it's not, uh, it doesn't change as uh, dramatic as the collagen content does. Um, but the most resistant part of the human body to uh, diegesis is, of course, are of course, the teeth. Now, you can analyze teeth in different ways. You can analyze teeth um, in children to show their diet when they were babies, because, of course, as you know, uh, the first molar erupts roughly after the child is born. You know, you get deciduous teeth first, which are the kids' babies' teeth, and then, of course, permanent teeth are underneath. So deciduous teeth have wide, have got wide, um, are very wide at the, uh, um, at the bottom, and so they allow the normal permanent teeth to come up underneath, and then, of course, residual, residual teeth are, 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 of course, shed. 
Now, M1 to M3, M1 being first motor, second motor, third motor, erupt at different times. So if you want to age a child, a child or a specimen of a child's body, you can age it according to the teeth and the close privacy closure, so, so on and so forth. So M3, which is um, the third motor, comes up at the age of 16. So you can work out a child's diet by actually analyzing uh, radioactive isotopes in teeth, in the dentin, in the cementum, and uh, and so on, and, and in the collagen as well, and the hydroxyapatite bit. The the hydroxyapatite bit the, is more resistant, as I said, to diagesis, and therefore you can uh, use it. It's more reliable to analyze than, for example, the uh, collagen content. But nevertheless, collagen is much more reliable than it is in bone, which of course gets broken down. Now, I, so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to refer to my notes, which is uh, I wrote recently on it. So um, the, the isotopes you can look at uh, are um, basically uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, strontium, and calcium. And I, the, um, as I said, the bio, bio appetite, the mineral content of bone and teeth um, is probably is really interesting because it's the more stable bit. So 75% of bone bio weight is made up of the mineral component, whereas in teeth it's made up enamel 97%. And this is the bit, that's why it makes teeth, that's why teeth are much more reliable to analyze. And as I said, uh, M3 comes up by the age of 16. Um, now, the other thing you can do is you can look at the actual structure of teeth. So, for example, uh, you can show by electron microscopy or even light microscopy, looking at the surface of the teeth, what, what type of dye somebody had uh, in, in the past. So, for example, we know that, that hunters um, basically had flat erosion of their teeth, uh, whereas uh, settler agriculturists tend to have an oblique uh, erosion of their teeth. So you can tell uh, whether they were hunters or agriculturists and there was settled farmer population according to the weight of the teeth themselves. And this is um, uh, this got to do with the type of, uh, for example, that agriculturists tend to boil their, their cook their food and grains and therefore the uh, food has got a different constituency than the fibrous food that hunters would have. And therefore the wear and tear of the teeth will tell you what type of population of people you're looking at when you're analyzing their teeth. The other thing that you can find in teeth are, for example, periodontal disease. We know periodontal disease uh, is a marker of stress and uh, in populations. So, for example, um, and also dental caries. So, for example, um, the, um, if you look at the Egyptian evidence, the pre-dynastic population 3000 years BC had a meat diet and didn't actually have much carbohydrates in their diet and their teeth were actually quite good. So if you go to the pre-dynastic um, burial sites like Abydos and so on, you will find very little uh, dental caries, um, about 5%. But when you look at the Greek period in, in Egyptian uh, history, which is you know, about 200 years B, 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 BC before the Romans took over, you find that the dental caries rate goes right up to 30 to 40%. And this is because of the change in diet. The Greeks brought in their food preparation, their food cooking, their cooking uh, techniques and also the change in diet with the Greeks, Greek settlement of Egypt, changed the dental caries rate completely. The other thing you can show in populations uh, of in the past of evidence of stress and malnutrition and so on is you can look for evidence of bone evidence of stress and there are four or five things you can look at. One is called Harris lines, which are lines of uh, growth retardation or growth where growth stops in, in the human that's been stressed. And the other ones are uh, Todd's nails and, um, and of course, enamel hypoplasia. So the, the enamel stops growing in the teeth, the bones stop growing, and also you get changes in the nails called Todd's nails. And these are all evidence of stress. So, for example, in the Badari population in Egypt, when they became, went from being hunters to settled farmers, where the food in, um, supply was, was very unpredictable, they developed a large number of uh, periosteal reactions and dental hypoplasia in their teeth as a reaction to the stress of the change in their lifestyle. Now, you may think that you don't see that in modern times, but I had a patient a couple of months ago who actually was very stressed because of her social circumstances. She was the sister of a medical student, and she went from having loads of friends in school in an established country to another country where her father retired, and she noticed then all these changes in her nails. And um, when I saw her in the clinic, she basically had Todd's nails, which are part of things of stress, which you see in all populations as well. And here was somebody in 2021 with Todd's, Todd's lines in her nails from stress. Um, I don't want to go into too much into any other, um, uh, uh, too much into any other uh, 
pieces of information related to it. But just a couple of points I will make um, in that you can use barium as strontium, for example, and nitrogen in teeth to show uh, different things about the, the geography of, um, of where the patients, where the people come from. So, for example, um, we we like looked at the last time we looked at Audi, and Audi uh, moved around that part of northeast from the southern Austria. Uh, we know, for example, by looking at different oxygen isotopes in him, uh, in his teeth, for example, that he grew in he grew up in southern, in northern Italy, and then moved north because he had a different isotope in his bone than he had of oxygen than he had in his teeth. So where he grew up, he drew, grew up in northern Italy, and then he moved north up into the Alps where he goes, became settled as a hunter or as a farmer, whatever he did. Uh, and the isotopes in his bones were the oxygen isotope was different from the ones in his teeth because the teeth, of course, isotopes are laid down when they're in childhood. Now, um, the last point I'll make uh, before we move on to TB is the analysis of what happened in Kilkelly. So I looked at uh, six uh, populations, uh, uh, different isotopes. The most important one we need to look at is 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 Kilkenny, but I will describe um, one other one for you, and that was basically medieval Fishgate, which is in uh, which is in um, in York. York is a very ancient medieval town, and the analysis done there was they looked at um, uh, Ghibelline monks. They looked at a, a church and a cemetery outside, and they looked at all the isotopes there. And you would expect the isotopes in the uh, monks are the abbots that were buried in the middle of the church because you know the more senior you are in a monastic population, the more close you are to the high altar. And they didn't show any uh, difference between the diet of the senior monks and the abbots versus the monks who were buried outside. So this was a lovely example of um, which contradicted, you know, the evidence, the evidence so far that um, the uh, monks and the senior monks had a different diet from the, the ordinary monks who worked out in the fields. Now, what about Kilkenny? Well, Kilkenny is very interesting because um, uh, I'll read it out. So the study of the Great Irish Famine uh, was of 20 poor Irish who ended up in Kilkenny workhouse, who subsequently died and were buried in the famine cemetery uh, beside the workhouse in Kilkenny. Analysis was done on teeth, predominantly M3, but some on M1 and M2. Um, so M3, of course, is 16, M1 and M2 earlier on in life. And the, the delta carbon 13 was between minus 21 and minus 19. And, and, um, uh, and the changes in the delta carbon in children from minus 22 to uh, minus 17 suggests a change from a C3 potato diet onto a C4 maize diet uh, later in life between the ages of 9 and 13. So what is this evidence showing? Well, this evidence is showing that, of course, these children came from the Kilkenny or countryside on a potato diet. And that was shown by the fact that um, their carbon uh, 13 fingerprint um, uh, reflected a potato diet first, and then later they changed over to a maize diet. And this was the maize that was imported in from the United States. So the dental analysis there showed a change in diet in these, in these um, poor children that died in Kilkenny. Most of them died in their 20s from diseases like chickenpox, measles, and so on and so forth and uh, pneumonias probably. So here's a lovely example of how the teeth were shown, used to show a change in diet of people who went to the workhouses in Kilkenny and many other workhouses in Ireland. Um, and this was related to a change of uh, diet from potato to maize. The other interesting about the study is that um, the, uh, the children before the, the other analysis of some of the adults and children show that um, that uh, the early part of dental and uh, the early um, isotopes in the dental anatomy were uh, carbon 13 and so on and so forth, typical of a potato diet. But then later on uh, in bone as well, uh, they were uh, predominantly nitrogen. And this is um, evidence of breakdown of protein in the body. So here's an example of somebody who's dying from malnutrition, whose initial diet as a child was based on potato, which is C3 food, who later in life, uh, because bone in ribs is constantly remodeled, had high contents of nitrogen, which means that they were breaking breaking down body protein to produce uh, nutrition. And of course, this is what happens in malnutrition. You break down endogenous uh, body structure. And this was a lovely isotope example of basically dying from malnutrition uh, in the famine. So, so, so far, um, and again, I don't want to get into too much detail, uh, another last five or 10 minutes on TB. 
But what we've seen so far is that um, there's been a huge advances made in archaeology and bioarchaeology and paleopathology with the use of chemistry and physics in the forms of mass spectrometry, which has completely revolutionized analysis, uh, carbon-14, which has completely revolutionized dating, and of course, isotope analysis of teeth and bone to show evidence of the diet in past populations and also evidence of uh, malnutrition and diet in settled populations like monks in York. But in particular, because most of the audience, I presume, are Irish, uh, we have evidence from Kilkenny Workhouse of uh, poor children and adults going to Kilkenny Workhouse, previously living on a carbon, on a potato diet, which is C3 food, moving into the workhouse, being fed maize, which was dreadful. Um, uh, if you read the literature of the time, uh, uh, they would describe how it was almost impossible to cook it, and which is a C4 type of um, uh, food, and also evidence of the children um, basically uh, having a potato diet initially when they were developing and growing up on a maize diet and even then the maize diet wasn't enough for them because some of them had evidence on uh, using nitrogen radioisotopes of so body endogenous breakdown of protein as a form of nutrition. So these kids were dying even in the workhouse of malnutrition and the isotope studies all back up this. So this is not just a pure mythology, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you, any of you want to read a good book uh, other than the one by Cork University Press on the Irish famine, there's one book written by Alan Delaney. He's the reader in Irish studies at Liverpool University and he's written an excellent book on the Irish famine about the response of the aristocracy, the Anglo-Irish aristocracy to famine, especially in areas like Wicklow and South Dublin and so on, just outside Dublin, all the rural, uh, all the, uh, the uh, rural landed gentry, how they responded to um, the malnutrition and famine amongst their own farm workers and so on and so forth. An excellent book. Now, the last bit, uh, which uh, I think will just take 10 minutes, will be TB. Now, I have lots of other material on strongyloid is, you know, hepatitis B, uh, malaria and so on. So I don't want you to go away today just thinking that TB is the only thing we have been able to identify in past populations. There is now an enormous amount of evidence uh, of infections from malaria, from hepatitis B, from uh, um, from basically strongyloid is from Chagas disease in South America in old populations, in old ancient populations. And people are now using these this evidence to show how old some of these diseases are, in particular, for example, uh, Chagas disease in South America and also TB in South American populations. The other interesting thing is that a lot of the errors that have been made in uh, macroscopic examination of bodies and even um, light microscopy, electron microscopy, some of those structural analysis of body tissues. This has all been redefined. For example, there's a lovely study from uh, Korea of a child who is thought to have died from uh, smallpox because of the cutaneous uh, lesions on the skin. It was a mummified body from Korea. But actually the analysis shows that the child had hepatitis B, which is of course an endemic disease in Chinese and, Chinese and the uh, Asian population right back thousands of years. And the skin manifestations actually were a form of hepatitis B. There's a specific skin rash you get with hep B. And it turned out that the analysis of this Korean mummy had been completely wrong for over 30 years. The child was in the baby, the specimen was analyzed about 30 years ago. So this is the impact molecular biology is making on um, uh, on the um, on the uh, on archaeological analysis of archaeological specimens in the past based on, I suppose, one could describe primitive techniques uh, of gross, but not, yes, I suppose they are primitive, gross anatomy is fairly primitive compared to um, molecular biology and genetics, which is much more refined. Now, the last bit of the talk, literally 10 minutes, is, is basically tuberculosis. So how bad is TB in modern terms? So I'm going to read out some data to you. So um, this is from uh, Richard Baker in Kings. He's a very eminent chess physician in Kings. So I'm going to give you three or four pieces of information of contemporary modern TB. And then we look back at where TB came from, who's had it, um, uh, what were its origins, was um, Mycobacterium bovis the original uh, Mycobacterium that got from cattle and transferred across to humans with um, development of agriculture and farming and so on and so forth. And this was the um, uh, previous uh, analysis of all of this. The previous assumptions were that Mycobacterium bovis was the original Mycobacterium and was in cattle and then was transmitted and transferred to humans with the increased milk consumption, use of animal, uh, you know, the slaughtering of cattle as a form of nutrition and so on and so forth. But the evidence, this is what 
people have been writing about for over 50 years in history and in archaeology. But the molecular biology analysis of this is again turned it around like it has uh, with um, with, for example, the other uh, like with the, uh, the example I gave you of the Korean mummy, the Korean mummy assumption was incorrect as the analysis of tuberculosis also looks like it's incorrect as well. The Mycobacterium bovis did not was not the parent Mycobacterium at all. And there is been almost no evidence of Mycobacterium bovis, for example, in 3000 years of Egyptian history. There's plenty of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, but almost no bovis. There's one sample of Mycobacterium uh, africanum, which comes from Africa, and that's probably got to do with trade routes. So the idea that bovis was the parent TB bug is, is now been turned on its head. So how bad is TB right now? Well, according to uh, Baker, um, in 2015, uh, there were 9.6 million people in the world developed tuberculosis, of which 1.5 million died. So even uh, now, it, six years ago, it is a horrendously aggressive um, uh, disease, almost pandemic, and that, but doesn't get the same press as coronavirus does, of course. And a third of these um, uh, were never diagnosed or treated. So most of these, of course, have been sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, some 1.2 million of these people are co-infected with HIV. And of course, again, 74% of these in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it is getting better. There is a big drop between 2000 and 2015 in the world incidence of tuberculosis and the mortality, I should say that the mortality, and the mortality has dropped by 47%. Now, most of the TB, of course, that we, you um, uh, that I come across in clinical practice or have in England, is of course reactivation of latent TB. And in England, uh, because I can't talk about Ireland so much, uh, most of the TB you see in the UK is reactivation of TB that's picked up in India, Pakistan, Biafra, uh, the emigrants to the UK, and 80% of them um, have been in the UK for about two years with latent TB and it reactivates for some reason, stress, TB, uh, being, are the, the patients developing um, Diabetes, which of course immune causes immune suppression of the TB reactivates, and 80 percent, 50 percent of them are in England for five years. Now, um, what is the world? Just what is the world incidence of TB amongst different occupations and so on? So, so the article by um, uh, by uh, Richard Baker shows as follows: um, the South African gold miners have an instance of 1,571 cases per 100,000 of TB. Uh, in Zimbabwe, general population 278. Let's move on to UK. Black population in London 197. Uh, drug users in London 354. Prisoners 208. The homeless 788. And the white ethnic population in, UK, in London 86. So six cases per 100,000 of white population in London. South African gold miners 1,571. An amazing difference between the two. Um, Final point before we go on to the archaeology side of it, and there's a certain there's a logic behind me doing this because in order to understand the archaeological evidence, you've got to know what's happening contemporarily with TB as a disease. So uh, uh, the principal sites of disease in 1,853 patients in King's College in London between 2000 and 2016, 47 percent were in the lungs. Now, of course, uh, it's very hard to find TB in lungs in, in archaeological specimens, and it's more it's much easier to find it amongst in bone. But of course, that causes problems because the spinal, in, the incidence of spinal TB in contemporary populations is only 7%. So if you were depending on bone of people who die now, for example, from TB, to give you a population incidence of TB in 2000, the year 2000, you would be, you would actually very much uh, under, under report the incidence of TB in the population because, of course, spinal TB, which is the only Data and sports, some evidence in plura are the only two bits, only two parts of the anatomy that will actually show evidence of TB in archaeological specimens. So it'll be very much under underreported in populations from the past. Now this X-ray shows a lovely example of active tuberculosis. So when you got consolidation um, uh, around a cavity, and the cavity is lined, line is outlined there by black, black marks. This is active TB. Once you get consolidation, uh, uh, this is active tuberculosis. And you can see it's bilateral on the opposite side. You've got some uh, evidence of it as well with a bit of consolidation. So this, and there's also some fibrosis here because you can see the upper medistan is pulled across. So this is somebody with right upper lobe TB. You can see the fissure in the right lungs. So this is a contemporary X-ray of what tuberculosis looks like. 
in modern terms. Next slide, please. So this is, um, uh, so the best uh, way I can describe what mycobacterium looks like uh, would be if you think of, um, uh, of, of if you think of a um, piece of cake, just a piece of cake uh, sitting on a, tr on a plate uh, as a bacterium. If you think of a piece of cake or a piece of pie with tons of cream on it, that's what the tuberculosis bug looks like. It's absolutely drenched in phospholipid compared to normal bacterium. And the phospholipid is mainly made up of mycolic acid. And this is exploited very much by biochemists to analyze different uh, serotypes of mycobacterium, different types, because they all got a different mycolic acid imprint. So as a contrast to normal uh, bacterial cell walls, like in E. coli or streptococcus, um, mycobacterium has got absolutely tons of phospholipid and fat in its cell wall, which protects it, of course, against uh, CD4 cells. The other thing about it, of course, is that it doesn't divide anything like E. coli. E. coli will divide every 20 minutes. The, ha the dividing time for MTB is 31 hours. And that's, um, uh, again, why it you can sit there for years, uh, you know, in a quiescent state and doesn't give you the aggressive reaction that you get with, for example, pneumococcus, which are E. coli when they're dividing. So um, the, just to show you the structure, you've got the, the transmembrane protein at the bottom, you've got phospholipid ester bond, mycolic acid, and then the, obviously the pore and then glycolipids at the uh, outside, and then complex free lipids. All of these are actually exploited when you analyze tissues uh, to see whether MTB is in them. So you can actually measure, you can actually quantify these mycolic acids uh, by using biochemical techniques. Next slide, please. And this is a uh, lovely example of the phospholipid structure again, mycolic acid, peptidoglycans, urbanogalactans. You don't get these structures in other bacteria. This is actually quite, quite unique. Next one. And these are the different uh, mycolic acids that are again analyzed uh, to show the evidence of TB in tissues, as well as obviously um, PCR and histology and staining and growth and cultures and so on. Next slide, please. OK, this is, um, is uh, Zee Nielsen stain. The word acid fast bacillus comes from the fact that, um, and you can see the red is um, acid fast. The fact is that if you put, uh, use, a draw, uh, use a dye called fusin and put it on normal bacteria and then wash it off with acid, it'll disappear. It won't call, form a covalent bond with the phospholipid. Mycobacterium are different. The fusin red dye sticks to the phospholipid, which I've just shown you. And even if you wash it with acid, uh, it will not wash off, hence the term acid fast bacilli. That's how, we, that's how the initial identification of mycobacterium is done by Koch. Next slide, please. And this is a typical uh, caseated granuloma, CD4 cells, Langhorne giant cells around it. Um, and the caseous material in the middle, of course, is just phospholipid from the bacterium and also the cells in the lung that are destroyed. That's why it looks cheesy like our caseous. And uh, this is a typical um, uh, caseous granuloma of TB. Next slide, please. Again, caseous necrosis, Langer giant cells and epithelioid cells around it. Again, next slide, please. OK, again, I, I'm not going to go into fine detail, but just to show you uh, how far back the history of TB goes. Uh, 2400 BC, Egyptian mummy. I'll show you one or two examples of that. Um, in 1679, Silvius, a French physician who taught anatomy in Paris, in the big medical school in Paris, who named the aqueduct of Silvius, uh, describes TB lung pathology. Then you come on to um, uh, 1854 with Bremer opening the first sanatorium. Uh, then you've got Koch isolating it in Berlin in 1882. And you've got Kalmet and Gurian in 1895 uh, developing BCG. And of course, Streptomycin in 1943. Um, it, was, it took another 10 years actually for Streptomycin to be released in Ireland. Uh, 53, 54 was the first time people started using Streptomycin in Ireland as monotherapy to treat tuberculosis. Next slide, please. Uh, same story again. Next slide, please. So just one other, one other two. Again, this is typical of open air therapy. So if any of you watching in Maryland Park, or the student in Maryland Park in Galway, that's why the units are, that are, are actually units out in the fresh air. 
and um, and a lot of the beds were put outside like this. When I worked on Thomas's, the um, the uh, what, there's a long series of paths along by the River Thames where the MTB patients used to be put out during this during the just average day, I suppose, summertime uh, as a form of treatment for MTB. Uh, and this is a lovely example of people getting fresh air uh, for the treatment of tuberculosis in sanatoriums and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, again, just showing you that it goes right back to 8,000 years BC, found in some Egyptian mummies and in sorts in South America. Next slide, please. It's also been described by Hippocrates and Aristotle in past times. Now, this is what it looks like in the spine. It causes, of course, you know, um, uh, destruction of the disc first and then the vertebral body. The body collapses, it's got porosity in it, see the holes in it, and then, of course, you get lipping. As a try, a lipping is a response to injury. Um, and you can see, uh, and then, of course, the classical side to get it in is D, T4, T3, T2, 3, 4, and that gives you your gibbous when the vertebral bodies collapse. So there's lots of histological evidence, macroscopic evidence from lots of different populations, Korean, uh, European, South American, of course, Egyptian and so on, uh, Chilean amongst the um, uh, mummified bodies from the Atacama Desert as well, of, of TB going right back thousands of years. Next slide, please. Again, evidence of vertebral body collapse and angulation. Next slide, please. Again, just this is bone destruction uh, by tuberculosis. Next slide, please. Periosteal reaction, as you can see on the left. Now, that brings us on to um, the last bit of the talk, which is um, I have two papers uh, on, uh, unfortunately, I apologize again for having to refer to them, but it's a couple of weeks since I actually went through the details. So the um, uh, best, no, not not the best, but the evidence that I find uh, really interesting is coming from Egyptian population because of the long history, mummification and, and specimens that have been preserved of evidence of TB in Egyptian populations. Now, um, the problem, of course, with TB, identifying TB in uh, in mummies, of course, is that uh, like um, uh, contemporary populations, uh, the instance of TB in spine are uh, causing psoas abscess, vertebral body collapse in bone is still only about five or 10 percent of specimens uh, analyzed. So it doesn't mean that uh, you can analyze and presume and, and then make the assumption that only five percent of the Egyptian population of TB. You can't do that because, of course, uh, they might have a pulmonary TB or uh, and might have um, TB meningitis, and that would show very little evidence uh, of uh, tuberculosis because only in 5% of people who get TB do you have bone involvement, uh, according to the contemporary popula uh, contemporary paper by um, in from the King's group and also from the analysis of uh, material done uh, in uh, Egyptian populations as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so what uh, contribution has biochemistry and molecular biology made? to the analysis and identification of TB in Egyptian uh, mummies. Well, this is the example of it. So what they did was, the, um, so let's go back and just describe what's been discovered so far. So the first thing is, TB goes back probably seven or 8,000 years. Second myth was that TB started off as mycobacterium bovis, and then, it, then the parent mycobacterium then formed into cansasi, uh, africanum, and so on and so forth. And that does not seem to be true uh, according to molecular biology evidence now, because in all of the analysis done from uh, both uh, southern Egypt and northern Egypt, there is no evidence of mycobacterium bovis whatsoever, and there's only a single case of Africanum. So it does not seem that uh, bovis was the parent uh, mycobacterium from which the other mycobacterium evolved. What evidence, what, what, do, you, how, what do you do then when you only have evidence when you only got a reliability, say, of 5-10% of the population with TB having bone evidence, well, then you have problems because, of course, you want to work out what particular type of TB is involved and what was the population incidence of the disease. And that's basically what the two studies, uh, two papers uh, looked at uh, in that I'm now going to describe to you in literally two or three lines. So instead of relying on um, uh, on just macroscopic bone evidence of tuberculosis, they used molecular biology. So what they did was, there is, yeah, they've got five minutes left. Okay, so I'm just, I'm coming towards the end. So what they did was, and I have to read out the details too, they, got, they did PCR on it. So what they did was, they went and they looked at a large number of uh, cemeteries in Egypt, um, in different parts of Egypt. So the uh, 
scattered the bottom down at the second cataract and right up to the delta. And they looked at Thebes, Abydos, a whole lot of other ones as well. Uh, and they went and they looked for a particular, uh, they used a restriction fragment, uh, they used um, a attack uh, in the nucleus to break down uh, material uh, that was biopsied from the bone in the specimens. And they looked for a particular molecule um, which is uh, a marker of, um, uh, which is a marker of TB, and it is, if I get the name for it, you know, it's one. Um, well, it's got, it, 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 it's got um, a molecular weight of roughly of about 2,000. It's one, one six, uh, one six, I'm just trying to find where it is. Anyway, it's a, um, it's a 125 base pair fragment of the structure of mycobacterium, which is quite unique for MTB. So what they did was in this slide, um, as you can see, the first line is the markers, the standard, and then they use the two beta actin because they put that in to make sure that the PCR reactions are occurring. And then all of the other ones show a protein that's classically found in MTB and not found in um, Mycobacterium bovis or Africanus. And they showed, for example, even without changes in the bone, you could still find evidence of TB uh, by just biopsying bones, but there's no osseous evidence. The evidence for TB in the specimens goes up if there is a periosteal reaction or if there's lytic lesions in the bone. So 58% of, of specimens looked at that had bone changes had evidence, nearly six in 10 had evidence on molecular biology evidence of mycobacterium mm -hmm. present. Nevertheless, about 20% or 28% had evidence of TB even if there were no bone changes by using uh, this uh, particular uh, gel, uh, particular uh, microbiologic, uh, ma um, molecular biology technique. So this is a gel electrophoresis, 4% gel electrophoresis, and these are fragments of MTB that are unique to MTB, and they run on a gel, and they have a roughly a molecular weight of 198, uh, uh, which corresponds to 2 or 2. There's a marker on the left, which is the standard, and you can see in all the specimens they looked at, some of them are quite weak, but number six, there was evidence of MTB present. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the last one. So these are the different uh, specimens analyzed, different periods from different uh, uh, different um, cemeteries, at, at Bydos and at Thebes and so on and so forth. As you can see on the macro, the macro structure shows, for example, just take one as an example. So it's number TT8470, New Kingdom. The specimen is 20 to 30 years of age. It's male, L45, advanced stage lumbar vertebral tuberculosis. And it's got this, the marker IS6110 is the marker of MTB. And they use beta actinin as the, so beta actinin is the structural protein. They use that as the positive control. Um, to show that the PCR reaction is occurring. So if the PCR reaction is occurring correctly, it will magnify beta actinin, and it also will magnify the structured protein you get MTB, which is called IS6110, which is unique for TB, MTB rather than bovis or, or cancer and so on. So as you can see, they didn't get a reaction in all of them, but they got a reaction in quite a number. And as, as you can see, there's deformity of L2, probably TB, uh, as you go right down. So we have macroscopic evidence. And now, with the advances in the last 10, 20 years of PCR reactions, we have now microbiological evidence, even if there is no periosteal reaction. So, in summary, I described to you uh, how radiocarbon dating is done and how you use it to aid specimens, its complications and its limitations. I described to you how you can use teeth in particular as evidence of diet in ancient populations, but you can use other things as well, like, as I said, coprolites uh, and even the vessels people use to prepare food as other evidence of diet in the past. I showed you evidence of the nutritional changes that occurred in one particular site, which is the Kilkenny workhouse, but I have five other places as well where the same analysis has been done using radioactive isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. And I showed you that a lot of the kids there started off with a potato diet, became, got a maize diet then, and as they got older and died subsequently, six or seven years later, they died from malnutrition because there was a high content of nitrogen in their teeth uh, because of protein breakdown. And then in the last bit of the talk, I talked about MTB. And I said that I informed you that the mythology behind Bose being the precursor of MTB is not correct, seemingly, and that it probably has nothing to do with us becoming hunters 
go transferring between hunters to settled farmers and domesticating cattle and using cattle, using the meat and the milk from the cattle. This idea that that was the way MTB transmitted from animals to humans doesn't seem to be correct. There's one contradiction by a guy called Rothschild who found MTB in a bison specimen and uh, is seven or eight thousand years old, showing that MTB was in cattle at then. But there's been very little uh, research done on MTB in ancient animal remains versus human remains. And the last point I make is that the uh, chain, the uh, what are the advances in archaeology with TB analysis? Well, the advances are the use of PCR to show IS six one one zero presence in bone specimens, and this is a microbiology, this is a molecular biology marker of TB in bones. And you can find it even when there's no periosteal reaction in the bone. So this is really advanced the research done in TB. Uh, a similar amount of research has been done in uh, strongyloides, in uh, Chagas disease, in, uh, in um, malaria and so on and so forth. So it's not just MTB, the advance has been made in. And that is uh, the evidence to date on uh, paleopathology. No, uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, a very informative uh, talk, full of information as always, uh, John. Uh, it gives me great, gives me great pleasure now to uh, introduce Professor Naji Al Mudan, who is going to be uh, our moderator for questions and answers. Hopefully, uh, Professor Naji is a consultant endocrinologist at King Hamad University Hospital and part of the internal medicine team, or the medicine team, sorry, at uh, RCSI Bahrain. So over to you, Professor Naji. So Prof, I just wanted to go over, ask you a few questions. So the radiocarbon dating, so it must have really changed some of the dates that we thought uh, over the years, like some assumptions. Have there been major changes or has it been a few years plus minus? Well, like, the radiocarbon dating, so thanks Naji. So radiocarbon dating is around longer than you think. The the guy who uh, developed it was an American biochemist and he got the Nobel Prize for it in 1960. And he initial paper was in 1946. So it was after the Second World War, it came along, but it didn't really go into, it was used by chemists and geophysicists first. And then they realized it actually applied better to bioarchaeological bio specimens better simply because after about 10,000 years, its accuracy goes down, or 20,000, as you can see from the half-life of the curve. And this is where argon potassium has come in. Argon potassium is now used by geophysicists, whereas bioarchaeologists and bioarchaeologists in general use carbon dating. I, I, it has revolutionized it, but remember, uh, tree ring analysis, you know, for example, the coffins, uh, sometimes the coffins in Egypt, in Egyptian, the coffins used to bury Egyptian mummies, whether they're pharaohs or not. Of course, sometimes they use that this they use a single tree. So the rings are still there. So they could they were using ring analysis, which is highly accurate before carbon dating came along. But what carbon dating and ring analysis of trees did was that they if I when I get back I'll show you the curve. It's absolutely brilliant. If you put on uh, if you put them on two different axes, the line is absolutely straight up between the two. They correlate very well, and this I think this is the most interesting thing about it, um, in, in that there is a very tight correlation between tree ring analysis and the carbon-14 dating. What I think is the most revolutionary is the fact a lot of the papers that have been published over the last 20 or 30 years in bioarchaeology identifying disease, uh, for example, uh, Flinders Petrie is the most eminent by a, a professor of archaeology at University College London. If you go into University College London, there's the Flinders Petrie Museum. It's an absolute must for anybody visiting London. Flinders Petrie was uh, probably um, he's the cock of TB. He would have been the say, corresponding man in archaeology. He did a huge amount of work in Egypt with his wife for about 40 years and brought her thousands of specimens back to London and they're all very well preserved. He has probably had the greatest impact in uh, in in the area of archaeology, especially Egyptian archaeology, but I think what's my caught my mind is how molecular biology, more than electron microscopy and light microscopy, has changed things. Molecular biology has got rid of, hasn't got rid of, has made doubt the doubt less in analysis of old disease in ancient populations. It's still not accurate because you can see in some of those populations, one six one one zero even though there are periosteal reactions, there's, they still couldn't identify TB. And that 
identifies the problem because you can get a periosteal reaction in brucellosis, for example. Therefore, periosteal reaction in a bone from a Egyptian specimen doesn't mean it's TB. Brucellosis will give the same periosteal reaction. But um, but when it's positive and you get a periosteal reaction, it's wonderful that it does that confirms that TB uh, is has been present in that population. One last point, which I didn't get as far as analyzing. In there's been several studies done recently in Hungary and in, in Hungary and in uh, well in European populations in Hungary and in Lithuania, and they showed, for example, there's a church in Hungary in a, rural, a small uh, church outside the capital where they found about 20 or 30 or 40 bodies in the crypt, naturally mummified because of the way it was built and the ventilation and low humidity. And they analyzed those spe specimens, there were 46 bodies, and over 58% of those 46 bodies had evidence of TB in them. So if you want to extrapolate what, from that is this, what can you extrapolate? Well, if you think if, if over half the bodies in that crypt had TB, then what can you say about the incidence of teeth? They're a medieval site, they're a medieval population. What can you say then about the incidence of tuberculosis in medieval times? If half the specimens in that particular church have got TB in them, it must have been a very, 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 very common disease in the Middle Ages. Um, and the idea that we have only 5% of Egyptian specimens having periosteal reaction, and then the papers from King showing that the bone is only involved in 5 to 8%, whatever the 5.7 is shows you that uh, if we were to use bone alone to show the incident to be in the past, we would grossly underestimate its incidence. Do you understand? And, and then how, do, how about things like proteomics, genomics, things like that? Is that yes, the yes. They, they, you no, know, they have used that's that's the next thing they're doing. They're looking at um they're looking at it's called uh, it's called spoliform analysis of uh, of proteins and DNA in uh, the specimens. And this is the next advance. It's where they can show gaps in the sequences of the DNA, which will identify which particular mycobacterium it is. So if you don't, if the 161190, for example, is negative and you got periosteal reaction, because that is got very, in mycobacterium bovis, that marker is very low in instance. So mycobacterium bovis might have been the cause of periosteal reaction. That would be negative, but they're using this spoliform analysis now in proteinemics to actually identify MTB that way, because the genetics don't are not as helpful with mycobacterium bovis. But I think what's important, Edgy, is this, that bovis, this idea that, that it was a transfer from cattle to humans with the idea of farming and development of farming and on humans using uh, the meat source and milk from animals was the origin of uh, tuberculosis is not correct, according to what I can see from the, the literature. Understand. I think that's the big thing that has changed in my opinion. Mm. I mean, there's tons more stuff to this, you know, uh, it's just huge. Very enlightening, a lot to learn. Thank you very much, Naji. Um, John, uh, as ever, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of information that's inside the, the, that uh, skull from the west of Ireland. <laughs> uh, and and the uh, skull at this stage. <laughs> uh, it really is an amazing amount of information and you're your in-depth knowledge of all of these complicated issues is quite a, quite quite amazing. Now, can, can I just um, use this platform just to tell both you and Naji and the four attendees that this material, this material uh, that I have been involved in, and also that uh, Dr. Awadi and everybody else, Naji and Martin and everybody else and Tom, that this will be the basis of subject for um, the uh, uh, year one and two of the news curriculum in 2022. So it actually is a formal subject from 2022, which I'm delighted with, and for which, for which I expect all of you to make some contribution if you're registered. If you're not, I, I will do it. But I mean, everybody, there's 10 lectures over one week and 10 tutorials, and I'm more than happy for everybody to make a contribution on any topic, in particular Martin, you and Tom on surgery, and, uh, and myself and Nadja will do, Nadja could do the development of insulin, for example, and discovery of insulin, I could do my stuff today, but we have a whole yeah, subject. Yeah, yeah. We might, we might, we might resolve that discussion soon. Of course, it's going to give this report. But I, I think, just in the interest of time, because it's now half past uh, six here and yeah, we're a bit right. late already. So, uh, thank you very much, John, and thank you, Naji, for moderating. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity to uh, let you know that our last uh, uh, installment uh, in the history of medicine in the, uh, is the history of medicine in the Arab world, and this will be. Uh, at five o'clock uh, 
uh, next Tuesday. Uh, and this will be given by uh, Dr. Muhammad Amin al Awadi, who's a consultant pediatric surgery colleague with me in King Ahmad University Hospital. And it promises to be uh, a grand finale to what has been an outstanding uh, webinar series. So I hope that, that everybody here can invite friends, uh, people you don't know, anybody uh, to attend uh, this meeting. Uh, we will uh, advise uh, RCSI uh, to send out the invitation. I'd finally like to thank uh, Victoria, uh, Nevin and Fauzia for their help uh, and patience uh, with, with, with somewhat technical challenges that we had this evening. So, yeah. so, so take care, stay safe, wear your mask, get vaccinated uh, and be healthy. Thank you very yeah. much, Shang. And uh, thanks, Martin. Yeah, God bless. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Devin, for your help. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nadine.